Okay. Just takes a minute. Well, good morning. I believe we are live. Let me make sure that everything looks good. Okay. Good morning, Nancy. How are you? Oh, good morning. I'm just fine, Ellie. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Thank you. So we will um, we'll wait a couple minutes while um, people get themselves situated because uh, we're on a couple minutes early, which is a miracle because I'm never on early. Um, <laughs> so let me... Um, pull up hmm, the comments so I can see um, any questions that come up um, and who is here. So good morning, Jennifer. Anna is here. Diane. I'm um, Kim. Okay, great. I, I'm guessing everyone can hear and see us okay because we're getting some good mornings. So um, where, um, what time is it where you are, Nancy? It is one minute till nine o'clock. Oh, okay. So you're an hour behind me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for getting up early for us. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, and Mickey is here too. So you know what? Everything's going to be just fine because Mickey is here. So. Uh, <laughs> Yay. Mickey is here with all our links. So um, welcome everybody. This is our Thursday morning Facebook live. It is, I don't even know what the day it is. What is it? It's the 22nd. It's April 22nd. And I'm very excited. Um, because we have a very special guest here. My friend, Nancy Ackley, will be um, talking to us a little bit about her journey into paper arts, into bookmaking and box making. And then she is going to show us some amazing samples of her work and also show us how to create um, a simple folded box, which you can then sort of take off in a million different directions. So um, we're just going to wait one more minute while everyone arrives and um, gets themselves situated. If you are joining us live, say hi in the chat. Let us know where you are from and what time of day it is. Is it coffee time? Is it lunch time? Is it gin and tonic time? Maybe it's cocoa time. Maybe it's bedtime. I don't know. So, all right. Okay, so we're at the top of the hour. So Nancy, thank you so much for being here. Can you just um, let us know... Um, a little bit about, well, first of all, where are you right now in the country? <laughs> in Sister Bay, Wisconsin, which is <clears throat> a little peninsula that sticks out from Green Bay into Lake mm. Michigan, and we mm. live on the tip of that peninsula. Wow, it looks, it, the pictures I see, it looks an amazing place to be. It really does. So, um, have you always lived there? No, I was born on the south side of Chicago. Oh. But my grandparents, who had a little corner grocery store when they came from Sweden, um, they came to Door County because the pastor of their church said, you're going to love Door County. It's nothing but rock. It's just like Sweden. <laughs> and it is. It's nothing but rock. It's a whole peninsula built on limestone and then limestone bluffs and, and things oh, really? like that. So about 19, I don't know, 1914, 1915, they um, made a cherry orchard and they bought a home up here. Oh. And then this was where we spent every single summer just um, working our tails off in the cherry orchard. And, oh, and then we'd go back the day before school started, we'd go back to Illinois. and So, so it wasn't these sort of long uh, idyllic summers, <laughs> childhood summers of just like lying and relaxing. They worked you like, <laughs> like crazy. <laughs> but also horseback riding lessons and also swimming lessons. And, oh, and nice. Plus, there were only two of us, my sister and myself, yeah. And we had um, Mexican migrant workers, um, the same folks every summer. So we oh, had wow. these built-in playmates and friends and they're lifelong friends. I still see them today. Is that so right? It was, it was a pretty wonderful childhood. Aww. And then the Illinois part, you know, you'd hop on the Skokie Swift and go down to downtown Chicago, to the yeah. Art Institute or to all these wonderful places. So it was, it was a nice way to grow up. So it's like and the then, best of both worlds. It was, it was. And then my first teaching job out of Carroll College was here in a little really? schoolhouse. Oh, interesting. And you never left? Well, I did. I went and I taught in Germany for a while for the Department of Defense. Oh, yeah. But um, then came back and I've, you know, I'm kind of an education dilettante, taught lots of different things and lots of different <laughs> grade levels. 
Yeah. Huh. Interesting. I didn't realize that your family were originally from Sweden. So that's kind of interesting. Only because my brother lives in Sweden. So whenever and everyone says, oh, well, they're from Sweden. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> so <laughs> that's really cool. Well, thank you. Um, I'm, di- I'm dying to visit. I'm, I'm, tr- I'm just trying to think up an excuse of why I need to come to Wisconsin to visit you. But maybe I don't need an excuse. <laughs> maybe we just need to come make books together. So, um, OK, so talking about teaching. Um, I think your educational journey is very interesting. So before we get into how you sort of came to book arts and your, your, what you're currently teaching, I think your um, journey in teaching is really interesting and one that um, I really connected with. And I think folks would be kind of interested in that too. So can you talk a little bit about um, your sort of teaching philosophy and sort of how that evolved um, during your career? Sure. Um- I started out teaching third grade for mm. several years. And, you know, every, every first day of school was like opening this wonderful surprise package and getting to know all these mm. incredible human beings was just such a treat. And that's the same feeling I have now teaching the adult classes in yeah. paper arts. You know, it's just like this wonderful surprise package full of, of tremendous, tremendous people. Huh. So, I, I, I taught at this little farm schoolhouse for many years, and then um, they moved us to a larger place. And I um, had a strong interest in how people learn and why they, you know, I had very bright kids who just could not process, but their gifts were in other areas. You know, they might be a great visual artist, or they might be a great athlete, or they might be a great actor. And so I, I became eventually the gifted and talented coordinator for our district. Mm. And a lot of people see that as a very exclusive kind of thing. You're just looking at academically talented kids with an IQ of 145 and above. Mm. That was not my philosophy, and that's not the way our program went. Our program, it was, my feeling is, you don't ask, is this child gifted? You look at all children and you say, what are your gifts? Mm. And how can we help you grow those gifts? So I would go into every single classroom and... Um, lead kids and talk, talk to them about different kinds of intelligence and help them to identify what their strengths were and yeah. help them because you you pull up and encourage and grow that strength all of their other abilities rise up to it most important their self-confidence oh, I love so that it that was an important part of um, of why I why I taught and and what I did um, yeah. I left public education when it became apparent that an IQ was the focus and um, I, yeah. couldn't, I couldn't teach the way I wanted to, which is when I started teaching adult classes and realizing the same thing, that, that adults need just as much encouragement to grow their creativity and to um, reach their potential. Yeah. You know, I love people who ask, what if? You know, what if I used this paper? What if I used this technique? What if I did this instead? Yeah. That's, that's, that's one of the things I love about what, what you are doing and the, the kind of um, exposure you're giving to all of these different, different ideas that people have and their different inspirations and creativity. Right. Well, it's amazing to me that like a thousand people can make a thousand different books every month from the same set of instructions. <laughs> Like, really, it's astounding to me that, you know, that that happens. So um, just peddling back a little bit, how did you find the difference between teaching children and adults? Like in terms of, you know, particularly in terms of taking risks and creativity, like was there a certain age where you saw kids just kind of stopped thinking they were creative or um, did you not find that? In, in first grade, I can teach the most ridiculously complex origami and they're just going, Oh yeah, show me more. Yeah. And then when I teach college students origami, about half of them are going, show me more. And the other half are going, Oh, I'll never get that. That's just too hard before they've even tried those messages that you give yourself are so important. So, you know, with adults and with children that you need to have successes first and then you just build on that and build and build and and that's kind of what I do with all of my classes you know we start simple and and build from there yeah 
there are more similarities than differences in teaching adults and teaching children. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, not everyone says that. Huh. Well, talking of origami, I know, because I just, because I know you, that is kind of where your love of paper art started. Mm. Am I right? That's right. That's exactly <laughs> yeah. right. Can you just tell us a little bit about how, you know, you started with origami and wound up being this amazing, like, um, book artist and box maker too, which we'll, we'll get to. <laughs> well, when I was eight years old, Illinois has the Saturday um, Park District program, and our neighbor was Japanese. So as an eight-year-old, she came and she taught us three things in origami, mm -hmm. and I just never looked back. I just fell really? totally in love with origami. And every single year that I taught, whether it was college students or whether it was first graders and kindergartners, or whether it was high school math or whatever, I used origami. It's just, it's so great for your brain. It's so great for sequencing. It's so great for visualizing because you have to use your visual memory to yeah. remember the steps. And so I would take children and adults both. Um, I, I would have them watch me make something. Then I would have them make it with me. Then I would have them close their eyes and I would talk them through making it. So they would have that image in their minds. Wow. And then they would go back and they would make it on their own. Oh, that's and interesting. They would prove things to themselves about their mind and about their memory, which was very exciting. It was really cool. Huh. I just, I'm just visualizing a, a classroom of kids with their eyes closed, folding origami. That's, that's mind blowing to me. <laughs> so how did origami then lead into, you know, making, when did you start becoming interested in making books? And then was it books first or boxes or? Books. How? books. When I was 16, I made my first book. Really? Uh, you know, my idea of heaven is a library. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. You know, I can remember as a little girl having dreams that I had a great aunt whom I'd never met who died and left me a library. Oh. Yeah, that was just like, <laughs> oh, the best thing ever. That's a children's and, book waiting to be written, I'm just say. <laughs> right. Maybe so. Maybe so. <laughs> and then when I started teaching, mm. um, every year we made, we made books because you know children love books and and they they see themselves and when they when they're writing and their drawings are in a book whether it was a book of, of recipes that we made for the whole class or a book of stories or a book of drawings yeah. every year we made books and we 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 a lot of folded books especially yeah. with the younger grades mm. and then more bound books with with older kids yeah and then when i decided to leave public education um, about five years before that, I had started my business, Liberty Girls Paper Arts, and right. um, it, it was just a natural. I had, I had taught myself several different um, bindings, mm. and I started teaching a book binding, and then I had all of this Chiagami paper that I had collected over the years, because Japanese paper is, oh, so beautiful, <laughs> and I wanted to continue acquiring mm. more because of course, that's what of I course. Mean. We all, yes, we all do. Paper collectors, paper, right? Paper, paper. <laughs> yeah. And um, box making was just a natural, a natural thing to do from there. Right. Huh. Can so you... I started with, with very simple boxes and then it became more complex. Huh. So the books came first and then the boxes. That's interesting. So just for people who don't know about that, oh, this is just an offshoot, but the Chiogami paper, um, could you just tell us a little bit about it? Because not everybody knows like what it is. And um, I know you're probably going to be showing us quite a few samples with that type of paper. So well, this is this is a good example of Chiogami paper. Yeah. It's just so beautiful and so strong. It's, it's mulberry fibers. Um, it's hand screened paper. It's made in Japan. And yeah. there used to be over 500 families that would make this. And today there are 50 families. Oh, so, we need to be so careful that we preserve this okay. tradition of, of making these papers by hand. Every yeah. single color on here is, um, they use a different screen to screen yeah. the colors on every single one. And it's so precise and so, so precision. And in between, they wash the paper. Yeah. And therefore, the paper is extremely strong. It, it stands up to water really, really well. It holds oh. beautifully. Yeah. Um, and the nice thing is if you make a box, let's see, if you make a box and 
you haven't necessarily glued the corners extremely well, that's okay because you have um, this strong paper on the outside, you have the strong paper on the inside, it makes yeah. your box so much stronger. Oh, that's interesting. Huh. So it's a little bit, it allows you to be not quite as precise as you. <laughs> I, think I, think it, I think it's pretty forgiving. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, is the paper itself handmade? Or is it just the, is it just the printing technique done by hand? No, the paper is also handmade. It's, it's a mulberry oh. paper. Okay, great. So there's no grain? No, it's no. Oh, it really that's is, nice. You know, you just yeah. Away and, you know, oh, that's really nice. Now it is pretty pricey, right? But it's because it's all handmade, right? And this right, and and it and um, you use it judiciously. Yeah, I can imagine. So, what are your favorite sources for it in the U.S.? Um, mulberry paper and more is a, is a good one. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. Let's see the paper place is also a good one. Oh, they sell but it. Okay. Hollanders is my favorite. You go to Hollanders for you. Well, because you live close to them, right? Or fairly. Well, you... about 10 hours. Away. Okay, no, then you don't live close to them. My US they... geography is not that good. When they well, I know. Maybe East Coast geography is not mine. When they had <laughs> when they had their storefront yeah. and the classes, yeah. I went there twice. Really? And yeah. because the first class I took was a marbling class with Gail and Barry. Yeah. And for taking a class there, they give you a discount on papers. So nice. Oh, oh that was, was nice. <laughs> <laughs> I drive 10 hours to, to get a discount paper. <laughs> it, was, it was wonderful. It was, well, and that's where I get my book board and, yeah. and a lot of my supplies and, you know, my gallons yeah. of PVA. PVA. And, yeah. Nice. So tell me um, a little bit. I know people are probably dying to start making, uh, watch you and look at some of your stuff, but I, I just, I'm, I'm just curious, how did you start teaching? Like, where did you teach? And like, because I know that you initially were hoping to teach book arts, right? And the people where you would teach were like, yeah, no one wants to make books. No, no <laughs> so, one wants to make books, no. no yeah, can you kind of yeah. tell us that story a little bit? <laughs> well, I, I, I took a class at the Clearing, which is a folk school not even six miles away from me. Oh, and it's nice. right on the shores of Lake Michigan. It's all, it's all just beautiful. It's wonderful wooded, wooded yeah. place. Clearing to the Mind is why it's called the Clearing. Oh, I took a class in paper arts from yeah. John Michael's Pack, who's the brilliant paper artist. Yeah. And she allowed me one afternoon of class, which was so gracious of her, to teach everyone how to make a box. Yeah. And I thought, this is so much fun. I can hardly stand it. And <laughs> Joan let me know she was not going to come back to the clearing the next year. And she, she had a class called Paper Magic. Yeah. So I just started teaching at the clearing, mm. a week long class in paper arts. And it was yeah. book binding yeah. and box making. Yeah. And a paper marbling. Nice. Nice. And then um, I, you know, I've, I've taught at various places around the world, but um, teaching locally as, as I've, you know, as I've aged. Yeah. Um, <laughs> seems to make more sense there's a little place called Seavers School of Fiber Arts on Washington Island yeah you know you need to take a ferry to get there and it's, it's quite wonderful nice and that's just that's just a lovely lovely place to teach so yeah those are the two places right now the clearing and Seavers School yeah that I nice. teach for the most part I've, I've traveled yeah. and taught in other places but it's flipping all the materials and stuff is just yeah it got it's me. not it's not, yeah, yeah, so I, I, I do know. I hear that from a lot of people. Well, talk to me, can you talk to me a little bit about the pandemic and how that affected you personally, like your creativity? Because I know some people suddenly became like very creative because they had a lot more time and some people just the anxiety of um, everything that was happening in the world kind of shut them down. Did you have either, either of those experiences for you personally? And then we can talk about like... It was well, the most embarrassing how little difference it made in my life. <laughs> there was a pandemic. <laughs> I couldn't hold my classes in person, which kind of broke my heart. Yeah. But to find out that Zoom classes were a possibility. Yeah. And by then I had a, a nice sized um, mailing list on my yeah. website. Yeah. Um, and, and then you were an inspiration to see the videos that you made. Yeah. So this actually has just been a blossoming time of creativity. Oh, interesting. Well, same here. Yeah. 
yeah, but you just you just hear different stories, right? It's either some people just kind of were totally blocked because they just couldn't, and and you know I completely understand that. But, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But well, you, it, it, I mean, we all have moments of, of that kind of. Oh. <sighs> yeah. But, well. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, interesting. So tell me. Um, so you started teaching on Zoom. Tell me. Um, tell me, like your experience with that. Like, how have you how have you found it? Well, the, the physical setup in my studio was so interesting. You know, I, I got all kinds of tripods and I tried with my phone and I tried with my iPad. Yeah. And, you know, it's just been an evolution of what has worked best, yeah. which, is, which is interesting. So the technology was fun to um, pursue. I had taught um, computer science in school mm. for many years and and... I still haven't figured out Instagram, but otherwise it's been yeah. really, really fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it you sounds know, like it, you embrace the technology and just you figured out how to make it work. And I had a lot of very patient people in my classes too. Oh. Like, <laughs> that really oh, helps. What if you can get in? Oh. Oh. <laughs> I know. I'll just send everybody another link. And oh, oh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we've all been learning together though, teachers and students, don't you think? Just kind of figuring it out as we as we go along so people are so understanding and so gracious yeah. so has it changed the way you teach do you think um teaching on zoom or do you really find you have the same connection with your students and um that you do in person like how do you feel about that there there certainly are differences yeah but um i just got a, a big screen not big screen but a larger screen monitor yeah. to attach to my computer yeah, it really has helped because then in Zoom I can see everyone. Yeah, um, and they can hold things up and I can help them in yeah. that way. And they can, I think, in many ways, it's an improvement over my in-person classes because they can see things um, with my overhead cameras so much more clearly. Yeah, than if you have and, a class where people are trying to like see and look around one another. Yeah, exactly. interesting so oh, are you are you going back to teaching in person you are now right mm-hmm. I have and starting in July yeah I have um, two week-long classes and mm-hmm. two three and four day classes and then two two-day classes mm. and that will all end in November okay so but you're still going to be teaching online too right so, yeah right. all right that'll that'll be fun could, could yeah. I give you a little just a little run yes. through of, of yes. where I started with boxes I yes I well I was to gonna I was gonna step back was actually and uh can we talk about boxes because that's I have to tell you it's something I really struggle with box making um so yeah just talk to us a little bit about how it came about and your sort of philosophy of making boxes and okay um I started out with really really simple boxes you know okay. nothing more than the marble papers or tiagami papers and just just simple 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 and then it just kind of grew from there because i started making multiples of these and um you know who could i give them away to and and my family had more boxes and more journals than they could possibly possibly ever (laughs) use in a lifetime so i thought well maybe i'll sell them but i just don't really enjoy selling my work a whole lot i mean it's it's okay and i belong to some artists co-op and that's been fun because you're kind of making sure that your work is going to a good home. Sure. And, and that's yeah. nice. And I love meeting the people, but mainly my time in um, any kind of shop was to simply garner more students from my classes because that's what yeah. I really love to do is show people how they can create something beautiful and wonderful. Yeah. So let me turn on the other camera. Yes, please do. Can you, yes. We, I think people would love to see some of the, the boxes you've made I'm going to spotlight you which means I'm going to um have to put myself on mute so hang on oh okay well this was one of the first kinds of boxes I made and then this grew into the the treasure box that I teach today and and this is just the same box just different size with a little pedestal on the bottom and a little more frou-frou stuff on the top a little friction lock here but it's again the same simple structure and, and this is a great place to start because basically every box i make well most boxes i make use the same kind of construction you know you can get into 
these really fun kinds of boxes that, you know, have um, different things that you can, you know, it can be different shapes if you could make it um, square instead of triangular. But this is really fun, you know, a place to keep my jewels, which is really <laughs> so necessary. And then about, well, I was also using my marbled papers and using the papers that people would make in class. And I bought some of these binding machines so they could just make notebooks. You know, it's the same technique of, of covering the covers and doing that. And, and people loved that. They could make a lot of, of notebooks with very little trouble. And then I started, I taught myself to make the magic box. And the magic box is just so much fun. It's a Japanese design and it opens like this and then it opens like this. And then I thought, well, then I'll use chipboard instead of bookboard and you can make just a, a little mini version of it. And then I thought, well, if I can do it with three sections, I could do it with four or more, but I could also do it with two sections, which is kind of fun. And uh, that's just been a treat. It took me forever to figure out how to do it, but the construction is actually a whole lot like um, Jacob's Ladder. You know, if you, can, if you can look and see, whoops, the way this, this is. And my then eight-year-old grandson pointed that out. Oh, it's just like a Jacob's Ladder. And after that, it was so much easier to make these. And then I started making books of different kinds. Um, I made some books with uh, covered spines and with wooden covers. And I started, I started, you know, like recessing stuff in the, in the cover with a little mica on top of it. And then because this is the Hokusai wave, um, you know, I purposely said, oh yeah, the Coptic stitch is perfect for this because you can catch the wave right there. Um, and then the, the boxes just grew from there. I made a lot of um, you know, clamshell boxes like for family Bibles and things like that. I did a lot of books and box combinations of different sizes and different types. So you could have a journal or you could have a special book that you wanted to preserve and um, make it a box for that. But, you know, these techniques are all the basic techniques of, of that treasure box. And can then we, the boxes- can we, Oh, sorry, yes, go ahead, Nancy, we, go ahead. Uh, no, carry on. Well, some of the some of the boxes I'm teaching now were just like you know what if what if I what if I took this and made a whole bunch of you know a quartet box where you could you could just keep different you know obviously the emeralds here and the rubies there and the diamonds there the jade there or supplies for your desktop or stuff like that so it's basically making four treasure boxes and combining them in certain ways and, and making a hinge cover, which is also really fun. Or just another little variation is, is this. And it has just this little caddy inside and then a place to uh, you know keep your earrings or, or whatever you want. Or one box I'm teaching this summer too, all of this grew out of that little treasure box. Um, this I call a puzzle box, I really like. And all the pieces come out and you can rearrange them. And it's just, it's really a fun box to, to make and, you know, a little magnetic closure. So Nancy, well, this all comes out of your basic treasure box, which is, so that's basically your sort of beginner box making class, right? Is, is all from yeah, that. Can we see the original treasure box again? Well, this is what it's evolved into, and this is the original treasure box. But this is this is the kind of treasure box that, that I teach in classes now. And that's a beginner box. You would learn the basics of box it is. making. Wow. And right, and and covering the boxes and stuff. You know, I've just learned so much over the years. I used to have a different paper on the inside and on the outside. It's much more a traditional fabric cartonage technique that I used in the beginning. 
And then one night I had, I just had a dream about like, oh, I know how I can cover the inside and the outside at the same time. And I, I felt I was a genius and it worked and it was so wonderful. And about two or three weeks later, I saw it online. <laughs> the same exact thing. Oh, that's too funny. Oh, great minds. Great minds. <laughs> great minds think like, can you, um, what are you working on now? Because I know that you're actually working on something new. Oh, um, I am so excited about this. Yes. Um, show, can you show us? It's a, it's a building block project. Um, I started out using this. I don't know if you can see. Um, it's just a, a little a little block. And it's made of six different building blocks. Um, you can make it large or you can make it small. I've made these uh, with alphabet letters on them for baby showers and things like that. You can make them so they're hinged and so the top can open. So you can make them lots of different sizes. This is made out of a 12 inch um, scrapbooking paper sheets. And then you, I, you make this little um, unit origami box that exactly fits it. And these are all out of six inch sheets of paper. I made a little accordion book with um, family pictures in it that fits right in this box which is kind of fun. And we'll, we'll make, I think in the class, we're going to make an accordion book and these modular boxes one day, and we'll learn how to make the other, the other pieces first day. And then this is just the kind of thing that I use when I'm doing displays. You know, it's just a little accordion that can stand up. And this one, this particular one says paper arts. So I, I, the thing is with this, a lot like the box that we're making today, the sky's the limit. You can just do so many things. Um, okay, so why, actually that's a good transition then. So um, the folded box that you're gonna show us today um, is very simple, but once you've made it right, you can Hold on, let me just unpin this for a second. Once you have, oh shoot, hold on, there we go. Um, once you've made this folded box, it can then be, you can just go in a million different directions, right? That's right, that's right. I, I saw the true potential after I was teaching a um, Chinese thread book right. class. Mm -hmm. And I had made this other box for years and years and years with school children. Um, let's see. I would teach I would teach children to make a box like this. Yeah. Um, for Halloween, mm -hmm. they would make a jack o' lantern and they would put half on each half of this, and then I would say, "Okay, can you what what is the most surprising thing you could think of that would open up and pop out at you when you opened up the box?" And they came up with wonderful things, or you know, or making hearts on either side for Valentine's Day or a flower for Mother's Day. And then some of them would have little things springing out of them and, or they would have just a little, you know, a little, I love you on the inside or a little note oh. as an envelope. Yeah. Nice. So it, it was very versatile with kids. Yeah. But there are a million things that we can do as adults too. Okay. You, um, and I, I show the, uh, the Chinese red book and why this works so well with it. Yeah, so uh, this folded box that we're going to do today, does is that any way related to the thread box? Yes, it absolutely okay. is. Great. Um, the Japanese um, thread book or box, you know, has a series of layers. This one has 15 different places that you can put things in. And you can use regular little boxes like this or you can use the little box that we're making today as one of the layers. And it, using it as one of the top layers, you can do so many interesting things. For instance, if you have something like this, this could be a card. You could, you could use um, maybe just a little signature here, maybe just done with um, very simple pamphlet stitch. And then you'd have these kinds of boxes here. 
on this side. There are so many possibilities. I can I can show you just one or two other things. That would be great. Thank you. Well, you know, with me, it's never one or two, but <clears throat> so there's this box, but you can also make an OV that can go around it. And this is just a variation. It's pretty easy. And the thing is, you know, you, you start making things and, and then you can make, you know, a little accordion fold notes that fit inside. Or this one's really fun. You open the top box like this, and then you go to this box and open that like that. And you go to this box and open that one like that. So you could, I've made these for, for birthday presents and for so many different things. And you can put sayings and little treasures and little treats and gift cards. And it's a very practical little box. That's amazing. Holy cow, my mind is whirring. Okay, so why don't you um, walk us through how to make this folded box? Because I feel like everyone's fingers are itching at this point. Oh, good, 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 good. It's not difficult, but it does take a little practice. So if we have an eight and a half inch piece of paper, let me just put on my glasses. I chose eight and a half because everyone has an eight and a half piece of paper, just writing paper or whatever, or computer paper. And you fold it diagonally one way and then fold it diagonally the other way. And really, if you get down to it, this is there are four basic steps for this box. Um, first thing you're going to do is a rolling fold. You're going to fold two opposite corners to the center. And then you open this up and you're going to take this tip and fold it to the center of that crease line you just made. And you'll see why it's called a rolling fold. It's one, two, and then you fold it exactly to the center. So it's like this, one, two, three. And the same thing on the other side. One, two, three. And as we used to say in first grade, you want them to hug, you want them to kiss, but not hug. You just want them to touch, you don't want them to overlap. So that's the first step is the, the rolling fold. And then you can see that there's a little crease line in the center. Just turn it over and fold back on that crease. And then here it's getting a little bulky, but two halves, two halves will match. Then you're going to take half of this bottom section and fold it right along that center. Maybe I'll bring this down a little bit more. Is that better? That looks great. Yeah. Good. Thank you. And you do the same thing on this side. And these are just guiding um, creases that you're making. You're not going to keep them creased. And they're kind of difficult to do because it's so bulky. But that's OK. Because the next step is a really interesting one. You're going to reach inside, and you're going to fold on those creases you just made. You're going to fold that down, fold that down. And when that happens, it stands straight up in the air. And all you have to do is take it and fold it down like that. So I'll show you again. You've made these creases, and you're going to reach inside and just fold. Basically, you're folding this center right along this bottom edge. When you do that, it stands straight up in the air, and then you just crease it down like that. And then turning it over, 
if you just ignore this part down here, you'll see that this is just the same shape with those same creases. But now they're facing in the wrong direction. So we want to take them and fold them up this way. So again, you can reach inside and just stand straight up. And it just matches the other side. I'll show you that just one more time. I'm going to take these and fold them up so the creases are in the right direction. Reach inside and stand that straight up and fold it down. All right, that's the second part. And then you can see that there's, there's a line there and a line there. This is two thicknesses. You're going to just take the top one and you're going to fold it on that line. And do the same thing on this side. So now it's kind of shaped like a little house. You're going to turn it over and repeat that on the other side. And now you're just about done. You've got this little house. You're going to take the roof of the house and fold that to the center as well. Again, just the top layer. And then you're going to take this whole flap and fold it down. It will not go all the way to the bottom because of the thicknesses of paper that you're folding. And the same thing on here, you're going to take the roof of the house and fold it to the center and take this and fold it all the way down like that. And then if we were in Japan, this could be a very sweet little wallet. So you could put things in there. It could be quite a fun little, oops, little puppet. Let's see, how can I, there. <laughs> and then for our purposes, you wouldn't try to open the box this way because it wouldn't work. You have to open it flat first and lay it down. And then you have a folding box. So it, it's a little involved, but um, I do have a video for people to refer to, and then you can take your time and, and practice the things. And from there, you can do so many interesting things. Um, one of the things I really like to do is to take the flaps and fold them into fold them into a little point. So you're going to take this and you're going to make it a point right up here, like that. A point like that. Like that. And then the same thing on this side. And then if you take a a five and a half inch square. Um, and I think almost anyone, almost everyone knows how to make this already. You fold this diagonally both ways, fold it in half both ways, and end up with a diagonal fold. You know, then you just Simply push down and sink that corner inside and sink that corner inside. And it makes a little, a little note or a little book that can fit right inside of the box. So a five and a half inch square will make a nice little note inside for you to open up and wish everyone happy birthday or whatever you're going to make with that. Let me show you a few other other possibilities. Um, to understand what sizes work, I, I often make just different samples, like this is a nine inch, and then I'll make like a six inch and, and to see how they how they fit with each other. This is the same um, same principle as the one that I showed you before. Um, and you just glue them in different, in different positions. And I used uh, Chiyogami paper, which is white on one side and colored on the other. Um, 
This is another another example. And this is a very simple one. Again, you can just make you could make a signature here or just make a card and then have the boxes on this side. But this one I really like. It's it's the same boxes. And you know, just in, in opposite colors. And you can make a folder out of anything. You could make a folder out of fabric if you would choose and just, just glue them or fill them down. Um, this happens to be the bottom box of a of a Japanese of a Chinese spread book, but um, and before I glued it down to the sides of that, then I just put ribbon on it. But there, there are just so many different ways that you can go. Um, you can fold the flaps into a heart as well. And, you know, really the sky's the limit. The sky's the limit. You can make, you know, different kinds of obis. This is the um, Hetty Kyle belt fold, you know, so you can fill it full of things and the, the belt can grow. And then you can, you can tighten it. That's amazing, Nancy. It seems like this with this one book structure, you could literally just work on this for like a whole year and come up with so Absolutely. many different options, right? Absolutely. There, there are so many fun things, you know, in, including different styles of, of OBs and just fun stuff, you know. It, just... When you say OB, do you mean like a belly band, like a closure? Yes, a belly band. That's exactly right. OB is the, you know, the sash on a kimono, for example have a we have a few questions that have come up um let me see um let me see um so to register for your classes nancy mm -hmm. um how do people register because um folks have been going to your website is there are there links on the website or do they have to send you an email to they sign send up me an email. they have to send you an email to sign up okay mm -hmm. okay and what is your email address N-A-K-E-R-L-Y at charter.net. Okay. We'll pop the Nance, um, Mickey will pop that in the, um, the, the chat too, um, in the comments. Um, another question that came up, um, what's the finished size of the box in relation to the piece of paper? So that eight and a half piece of paper, what size box did it make? It makes a box that is three inches. Three inch, so from eight and a half to three inches. Wow. It's about, it's about, a, about a third. About a third. Oh, someone, yes, yeah, someone just posted that. Nice. Um, let me see. Uh, let me see. So we've put the um, YouTube video, we've included that in the comments um, so people can um, fold along again with you. Because, like you say, it kind of takes a little bit of practice, right? To it does. And, and for me to just go through it once, you know, yeah. it, it, it takes more than once. Yeah, you need to, to go through it a couple of times. Yeah, that's amazing, but go ahead. May I, may I show you one other box that- You can show us as many boxes as you like. We're in box heaven right now. I started I started making house boxes. This is, um, when I first moved to Germany, we lived in a hotel for about three months. Oops. Oh, I've, I've... You turned yourself off. I guess I did. I, you know what, I think I will unplug and replug. Oh, okay. No worries. <laughs> it happens. Um, I think you need to start video in the mm -hmm. lower left. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Um, and right across from the hotel where we were living was this wonderful half timbered building. It was the oldest building in town. And so I thought that would really be a fun box to make. So I make that and I keep a lot of my little miniature books inside of that. But I mean, the possibilities, once you learn the basics, this again is simply the basic treasure box structure um, with a few embellishments. That's amazing. All from that basic treasure box. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. It really... It's wow. um, variations on a theme and, and I, you know, I'm glad to take people along with me on that trip of developing those themes. But yeah. really, once you know the basic treasure box, 
you just keep adding more and more nice. variations. Wow. That's, I'm stunned. So um, I suspect you may have lots of people joining you for your next treasure box class. What, what are the dates on that? Do you know off um, the top of your head? It's, it's a one day class. It's just May 8th from 9 one day. to 30. Mm -hmm. You learn that in one day? Um, wow. You do, you do. That, That's like great. The, the quartet box, that'll be a two-day class. And the bi-level treasure box with all the little compartments, that's a, yeah. a two-day. But the hinged box and the treasure box are just a one-day. And wow. I just want to put in a plug for paper marbling. If, if you've Please never do. tried marbling, it is absolutely one of the most fun things. It, it's much like paste paper mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, eco printing and stuff that the thrill of making your own papers and then creating out of those papers. It's just wonderful. We need to um, do that in the, um, the book club. I think that'll be really fun to have like a, like we had the paste paper day, have a paper marbling day where everyone marbles together, like oh, a, mar a marble a thon or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, another couple questions. Um, your uh, bone folder. Where did you get that from? <laughs> you know, the last um, order that I placed for Bookboard from Hollanders, they just sent it as a little gift. Isn't that nice? Oh, yeah. Ooh, I wonder how they did that. Is it, does it look like it's painted or? You know, I, I, I think it has to be, but um, it also feels it like it, it is truly bone. It's not plastic. Oh, wow. So it's huh. really pretty. Interesting. Oh, well, thank you. We'll have to, people will have to chase up Hollanders for that. So, <laughs> well, um, anything else that you would like to share, Nancy, before we wrap things up today? Um, I think people are so inspired by um, your boxes. I can't, I can't even. So um, is there anything else you would like to share? Well, just the, the, the joy of taking classes during this time of the pandemic has been, I think, Twice as intense, the, the joy of being in the book club, learning something new, learning a new technique, and then saying, well, what if, what if, what if, what if? Mm. It's been, it's been life-saving. Mm. Um, Ali, what, what you've done is incredible. Well, it's incredible. been life-saving for me too. So I'm not, <laughs> so yeah. Well, thank you. That was very sweet of you to say, but um, I hope that, um, Folks will um, consider if they're intrigued by box making. I hope they will consider joining you for the um, the beginner, the treasure box class, and then follow on from there. Are you are you going to be teaching online classes throughout the summer, or are you taking a break? I, I probably just one a month. One until, a month until oh. November. Oh, that's they, plenty. The, the class in November, Ellie, is so cool. It's at the what clearing. is it? It's a uh, paper arts week. You start out with marbling and paste paper. And then we use the marble papers and the paste papers to make uh, just, well, we, we do book binding and we do box making, a little bit of origami thrown in there as well. Nice. It is just so fun. You just immerse yourself so totally. Oh, so that sounds nice. But that's in person, right? In that's Wisconsin. In person. It is. Wow. It is. Uh, so that's at the clearing. We should probably include a link to that unless it's already full. But um, perhaps Mickey could find a link to the clearing. In Wisconsin. The Clearing Folk School. In the Clearing Wisconsin. Folk School. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for sharing that um, amazing folded box. And my, I think everyone's mind is like buzzing with ideas. And thank you for sharing your class. Thank you for bringing your classes online. I think they brought a lot of joy to people throughout, you know, the pandemic. And I, I hope you continue to teach online um, because uh, it's just a gift to be able to bring it to people you know, all over the world, but in their own homes. So, because we can't. And, and the biggest gift is is to me, the people I've met and, you know, right. being able to share. So, yeah, same here. I, I think those of us who teach, all right, I've never wanted to be anything in my life except a teacher. Never. Really? When I was four years old, there's a picture of me on the front lawn of our house, sitting, teaching the neighborhood children to read. I could not read it for, it didn't matter. <laughs> I was still teaching them to read. Is that right? <laughs> and, and being able to do this brings me as much joy as 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 mm. any. So that's a great 
that's a great way to end. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, really appreciate you sharing your gifts with us. And um, hopefully we've introduced you to some new people who will um, be emailing you about taking some classes and learning more about this amazing world of making boxes. So, well, thank you so much. This is thank really you. Fun. Thank you so much. And um, I will see you soon. Right. <laughs> All right. Take care. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And we will see you back here um, next Thursday um, on my Facebook page at 10 a.m. Eastern. All right. Take care, folks. Bye bye.